you guys. So do I have 35 minutes, obviously, because I've been wondering about that for a couple days. Um, so I was joking around earlier, but this is kind of a full circle moment. Big Omaha, I came, I think, three years ago. Um, and it's kind of the reason I started speaking in the first place. Um, it's also somewhere where I started being kind of um, empowered to realize that I didn't have to leave, if that makes sense. Um, one of the big Omahas I was at, someone said, the first thing you should do is just leave. And I obviously disagreed with that. And I think that there's a lot of people who work at Douala who would also disagree with that. I think that's probably one of the key differences between me and a lot of the other speakers that speak at Big Omaha. I don't think there's anything wrong with not being from here, but uh, the fact that I am, I think, gives me a little bit different perspective. I think that there's a lot of people in the room that have challenges because you're building your companies here, because you have team members here. You are basically just chasing talent wherever you can get it. and. Um, it's unique to do it from here. And I will say that everyone from outside the area seems to have a slightly different perspective. Um, so how many people are actually like Midwest based? Fuck yeah. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, Jordan. I said I was going to tone it back. Um, one thing about me that I also think like this community of people gave me is I used to um, hide the fact that I was a founder or an entrepreneur. My first company was doing a million half a year in revenue. I had no investors and like, I don't know, like half a dozen employees or something like that. We didn't really know what we were doing. We were profitable. And I was in my early 20s. And if you asked me what I did, I would lie. I would say, you know, I'm an engineer, which you could argue maybe I was and I was working on that. But the last thing I would do is tell you I owned a company. Because inevitably, the reaction that I would get from people in kind of my parents' social groups and things like that um, was just absolutely negative. Um, kind of like this, you know, oh, okay, whose dad's funding that? Just like some, some form of BS that made me like almost ashamed of it. And until I kind of found this group, this like tribe, whatever like you want to label it as, I wasn't really sure what to do with myself or how to define myself. Um, and so I also recognize that a lot of the conferences I speak at, like people have this like pedigree. The pedigree seems to be based on where I worked before, um, where I went to school. I don't know how many of you guys recognize this, but there's always these things where like, was this person like at Twitter? Was this person at Facebook? Did this at this other social company? Like uh, Dwala was founded overlooking a field. Like, my background is like this. It's the Midwest. Um, I didn't come from a web background, blah, 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 blah. All I know is what you can really learn in the Midwest and just through an internet connection. It's another thing that when I got started was really daunting was the more pitches I started to do, I started to see like these things that were like, you know, Stanford MBA, blah, 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 blah. And what I ended up finding was is like, who gives a shit? Um, <laughs> Like, I have an internet connection, which means all the world's knowledge is free for me. And you don't need a professor to tell you how to Google, right? I think that um, that's something that over time has taken me a long time to discover and actually appreciate to where, you know, we interview a lot of the people that have, you know, Harvard or Stanford MBAs and are really, really, really intelligent people. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with it, but I don't believe at all that not having an education from those places is a bad thing. Um, I was a really mediocre student. I'm a college dropout. I started my first company. Uh, I stopped, while well, I was in college, quit, stopped going to class because I had customers, essentially. You know, I think that I have the same problems as you guys here, building your companies. And those things are, you know, intercompany culture, local culture, money, time. Like, we're building these ecosystems to support one another in our endeavors a little bit. I mean, how many people, when they started out, knew they needed a mentor, needed an advisor, a great attorney, and a great accountant? Like, how many people just knew that starting out? I mean, like, most of us had to screw up pretty hardcore and almost be forced into it, right? They're really expensive mistakes, and I think that that's one of the things that's missing here. And uh, I think there are a lot of moments where you can just end up like really pissed, just like really fucking angry. And it's because you don't know where to turn, you don't know who to ask. And I think that this community has come so far, um, and I think that it's just kind of amazing to have watched it happen. When I initially started coming to these events, I didn't know anything about venture capital, I didn't know anything about you know angel investors, I didn't know anything about uh, 
anything, really. Um, the first one I came to, I pitched Danae from Indiegogo. Do you, does anybody know Indiegogo in here? And she would, I mean, she would agree that, like, she's like, oh, you know, so you're doing payments. Oh, that's really cool. You're going to pitch it to me now? Um, obviously, I did. Um, but, like, I kind of had to learn the hard way, just like many of you. Um, and I've learned that starting is probably the most important thing you can do. Some things are just simply a measure of did you try or not. The probability that you will actually accomplish what you set out to do if you simply try is an unbelievable differentiator um, that I think people underappreciate. Um, the thing that we kind of set out to do at Douala, I, Silicon Prairie News was the first um, publication to ever write about Douala. It was the reason we got uh, investors. It was how we found investors. It was the reason we got meetings. It was like the single catalyst that allowed Douala to stay in the Midwest. And I think that that's, uh, absolutely, that's extremely worth appreciating. There's a lot of well-employed people in the company who have those jobs because of, at least in my opinion, this conference and the people around it. And what we kind of set out to do is something that was relatively simple. Um, where I was going with that is actually, how many people have heard of Douala? All right, so I won't pitch too hard. I won't pitch too hard. Um, this, the only thing we really care about is allowing people to simply move money or building the ideal way to move money. Notice that isn't like United States currency, that isn't yuan, that isn't virtual currency. Like we're totally agnostic. Our feeling is that a transaction engine should allow people to exchange money without money being made less valuable. So if I give you $100, you should get $100, or as much as humanly possible. And the catalyst for that should be an internet connection. That's something that 30, 40 years ago never existed to carry messages, which is really all payments are. Our money is essentially data in a database that we simply exchange. That's really all money is at its core. And building a system with a certain level of interoperability that allows you to exchange funds really quickly at an accelerated rate is what we care about. And if I break that down to just some simple things, that means we don't use plastic cards. How many people have a plastic card? Okay, so basically every time you use that, you bring with it a ton of fees, a ton of risks, a ton of inherent built-in architectural flaws. Our system bypasses those and keeps money flowing in the economy. Those cards cost the US economy alone uh, a little over $40 billion a year. And there's no alternative system for that not being the case. That's what Douala does. There's like this simple, way of looking at it, which is a uh, credit card allows you to get money out of your bank account. All money you spend comes out of your bank account eventually. We're just software that allows that to happen efficiently through mobile wallets, through anything connected to the internet. It doesn't necessarily matter. One of the things that's really special about us is we created our own framework. So how many people in the room have like merchant accounts or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. So you guys are familiar with, basically, you, when you get paid, you don't actually get paid right away, right? You have to wait a couple days for it. So that's because of something built into our nation's kind of money movement system or bank transfer system, and it's based on something called batch, which is you drop a file off, it gets picked up at a certain time, it goes to somebody else, it gets picked up at a certain time, and eventually it gets to the Fed, who basically says, I got it, and then passes it back the same way. This all happens totally unencrypted, and it takes days to clear. Kind of scary. But one of the core things that we do is we created a technology that actually allows those payments to stream in real time, removing the batch. And in doing so, basically frees up a risk in the economy of about $4 trillion, allows money to move in real time, which the economy can't actually currently do with other software, at a cost which is virtually free. And we feel like that's a really amazing thing. But most of this today is not about payments. It's about hard lessons learned, things that I think I did right, mostly a lot of things I think I did wrong, and things that I think may help you guys in your endeavor. Uh, how many people are building companies of their own right now? It's amazing. Um, how many of those companies have offices in outside areas? Amazing. That was something that we started looking at really early on. And when I talked at Think Iowa, our company was like maybe around 12 people. I think we have around 40 today. And so we were starting to work through like what were our assumptions about building a team across geographies and across a roadmap. Something that I felt like was missing as a knowledge base for me and a, as a founder building a company was an actual roadmap. And so the way I thought about it at the time is like, 
But whether or not you look at it in terms of investment or in terms of valuation or in terms of revenue, there's like these pretty clear stages. And for you know, tech companies, a lot of it becomes C stage, series A, B, C, D, where inevitably at the end of that, you either have uh, an acquisition where you become the acquired or you become the acquirer, right? And so when I started trying to look at it, this is how I kind of broke it down, where I think getting past series A here is relatively rare. Um, and getting past series B is even smaller. How many people are running like series C or beyond companies in the room? Like it's super fucking hard. It is super hard to get there. Excuse me, I'm gonna stop now, Jordan, maybe. So the reality is, is like when we looked at it originally, we were in Des Moines, Iowa, we were trying to raise capital, we were going out, and that was before we closed the last round that Union Square Ventures in New York led. And what we realized was a lot of people in the community actually were deterring us from talking to people outside of the communities. One of the questions I asked at Think Iowa was, what can we here do to better connect with New York and San Francisco? Because traditionally those are where the tech hubs are. They're not gonna come into us, we essentially have to go out to them and show them what we've got. We've got the assets, they just don't understand them. And so we were trying to break down this barrier at the time of how do we take away the barrier of us versus them? Like we're all solving the same problems and our communities and like geographies all have specific strengths. We just need to learn to connect them. And actually that's exactly what we uh, ended up going to do with the last round that Andreessen Horowitz led. Um, we're opening up an office in San Francisco and we're creating basically a talent pipeline through the country. And we're doing it very deliberately because we believe that geographies have specific talents. We currently have offices in Des Moines, Kansas City, Omaha, um, in New York and now San Francisco. So my belief is that if you um, can build a better company by being in multiple places at once, which with a large enough team you actually can do, then you should do it. And I think that that's actually a fairly okay thing. I don't think that you should fight for doing everything here because you have to. And I think one of the worst things that you can do is just get up and leave because you don't think it's possible here. Connecting to the assets that you have here allows you to actually create something really special and create products and services by leveraging uh, talents that the rest of the country totally ignores. There's a hell of a lot of people between New York and San Francisco and a lot of them have really big ass brains. And they're totally ignored because that's where they are. And I think that that's a huge mistake. And so across the offices that we now have, we have 40-ish people. I think that that's probably gonna grow to 70 or 80 by the end of the year. Maybe more, maybe less, I don't, I don't really know. And putting focus again on how we build that pipeline is something that we really care about. So sitting's having specialties in a unique heartbeat is something that I think is uh, exceptionally important when building like almost a company that's almost like ha as, it's almost an organism. I mean, it has feelings. You have a lot of people with a lot of different things to say and it essentially needs to be managed and it needs to be grown. I think that things in New York, and Shane told me this one time, New York is really uh, unique and the heartbeat is so strong. Like, it moves really fast and people care. They're extremely passionate about it. They care so much about the numbers that they're constantly always measuring themselves. San Francisco, on the other hand, has really fantastic product people, a lot of really good technical people that worked in product, but there's also this like other side of things which is, there's, there's a lot of emotion there and that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, Des Moines and Omaha are really strong in financial services. You should never discount the talent of the people that are building the technical products behind financial services. Insurance and payments, it's hard to argue that those aren't specialties of Des Moines and Omaha. Also, Kansas City is absolutely ridiculous in design. I'm not saying there's not great designers everywhere else, but there are pockets of designers in Kansas City that continually amaze me. And I think now we're also going through the transition of how we don't start to look at only the United States marketplace, which by the way has a total market value of somewhere around $600 trillion for payments. It's absolutely massive. And we have to start thinking about how we start looking at an international expansion and how we start treating the entire world as an us. Because ultimately, if our network is going to succeed or our company is gonna succeed, it's not built for one marketplace and one currency, it's built to be a global infrastructure. And so that's how we're trying to modify ourselves right now. Where I thought we would be on this roadmap is like halfway done. Obviously we are not even close to halfway done. Where we're constantly realigning ourselves as founders, as part of our team, as parts of a family, and there's nothing wrong with that. The reason I wanted to pull this up is because there are certain things about it that I think were accurate. Once you start talking about like tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars, it gets a little bit bananas to think about that. 
Like, if you had $20 million, what would you do with it? Would that be enough to build a meaningful company? Dwell has raised a little over $20 million, and I, I think we'll probably raise more. I'm not saying that the money that came in isn't been valuable or has not been valuable. It has been. However, to build a, a global infrastructure company takes time, really smart people, a lot of money, and it's simply not easy. And I think we're realizing that we're just not halfway there. Understanding and making these assumptions ahead of time and then sharing uh, what changes I think is really important. And ultimately, where we were trying to get to a million and then we were trying to get to a billion, now it becomes how do we get to a trillion? And that's a number that there was a point in time in my life where ever thinking the word trillion would have been um, like asinine. It's just not feasible. It's a number that doesn't even seem real because I'm never going to have that much money. It's not ever going to make that much sense. But quite frankly, with the company, we've had to adapt to understand that serving the marketplace means changing the way we think about a lot of different things. I'd also like to put this out there. I think building a company is extremely difficult. I don't know, would anybody in this room who is a founder say that founding their company, running their company, and making it be the thing that they want it to be had an easy time doing so? I think that's something that we need to be really honest about. Like, this is exceptionally difficult. There are a lot of challenges and there's a lot of things that we sacrifice, especially being in the Midwest, because one of the things you need to understand as far as connecting to outside communities, your team might get to be here, but you're going to spend a lot of time on, your pl on a plane. Um, I got a Delta card, like, I don't know, maybe a year ago, and I just cost like 300,000 miles, or I'm at like 298,000 miles, and Delta is not the only airline I fly. You know, there are things that we, being in the Midwest, I think should accept going into this stuff. The cost is great. I think the media hypes up things, but we can't look at building companies the same way you would if you were in San Francisco uh, and reading TechCrunch. How many people in the room have kids? I mean, that's amazing. You, you probably like your kids, right? You probably want to see your kids. You probably want to see your wife. You probably want to like eat dinner with them. You probably don't want a, uh, a, a future on Skype. Like, you probably won't want those things, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's worth appreciating. There's a lot of people that are on these coasts that are basically the ones creating the content and creating um, or in consuming it just the same, that they're not living in the same reality as you guys. I'm not saying that as a negative, but there is something a little bit special about us here that when you're 23, 25, 30, having one, two, three kids, that's not that strange. To take care of that family and educate that family in San Francisco is an astronomical amount of money. And the quality of life we have here is um, it's worth appreciating. And I think that that's something that needs to be managed well because we have something so special in the Midwest that's worth protecting. And the toll it will take on everybody around you is simply part of uh, starting companies. Um, how many founders got paid when they started their companies? I feel like you are a lucky man, right? So most founders don't get paid. My first company I funded by selling my guitars that, or my guitar and saxophone that I was really crappy at playing on eBay to put in my first order for parts to sell stuff online. That's how I funded the first company. The second company, which was Dwell, I got initially funded because I got a tax return and I was trying to decide, do I buy big screen TVs or start a company? And I thought, oh, screw it, I'll try this thing out. Um, ended up working really well, right? But understanding and removing that as an expectation when you're looking at how to start your company, whether or not it's a lifestyle company, or whether or not you're trying to build like a billion dollar company built on a different technology that doesn't exist, it doesn't necessarily matter. But the first day, like you don't make any money, man. So when you go pitch people or you start talking about it, don't ever have some sort of attitude where it's like, well, I showed up, I should get paid. Like, no, dude, go work at JCPenney. Like that's not how it works when you're building companies. And I have definitely met founders here that don't fully understand that. And so I think it's important just to get it out there. Um, founders are also exceptionally over leveraged. So how many founders in the room have ever said like, all right, I got to get out or double down and then double down. Double down being like second mortgage, selling a car, or selling something they didn't want to. So you guys know like that shit's not easy. Um, it's amazing what happens when you say like, I have to give up this thing, like maybe a car I worked really hard for, and like trade it in for a bike or start taking the bus so that I can keep my company going. And to build a company, like you're gonna go do that stuff. Don't pitch if you have a nice car. Sell your damn car. Like come up with a better prototype. And I think that for a lot of founders, your company becomes your life savings. And 
if you have like all your, all your eggs in one basket, that's something that becomes very stressful. And for a lot of founders that build these companies, um, the thing that becomes really amazing as the company grows, it's not just about you as a founder, it becomes your team's life savings too. And a lot of these companies, teams start taking equity just like founders and they become vested in the company's overall success. And that's worth appreciating. And once these people come, it no longer matters that you are first at all. The sooner you give up on the whole notion of like who was first, who knows the most, who has the most blah, 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 who's on the org chart and all that dumb shit, just get rid of it as fast as possible. As soon as they come into your company and they own any equity, they're in the same boat as you. And I think that's worth appreciating um, up front. I also think that like you, the people on your team will get really excited about making things and just simply being excited. And don't try and control it too much. Just let it rip. When people have freedom and um, a level of autonomy, they build really fantastic things that you would never think of. And at the end of it, it's totally worth it. You have the, like, the right structure at home, you have the right investors, you gave up the right things at the right time, and you didn't push too far to lose the things you really cared about, it is all worth it, every piece of it. And at least I'm personally really glad I did it. As a group of things that I found to be true, bumpers is something that I know as just a word doesn't make a lot of sense, but you always surround yourself with people that give you constant feedback. I tend to make really extreme decisions when I make decisions alone. So I have like a group of people around me all the time that are constantly acting like pushing and pulling from like too conservative to too extreme. My decisions are probably still typically on the extreme side of things, but I make a lot better decisions that put a lot less people at risk because I have the right people around me. I think that's also helped level me out a lot over the last couple of years and give me um, a lot more feeling about like what I should and should not do. Another thing I found to be very true is like Biggie was right. More money, more problems, man. Like raising money or more sales is a solution to a problem you think you understand, but as soon as they come in, there's always something else to fix. And in your companies, until you quit or until you find a different CEO or so on and so forth, you have to continually be solving problems. And that's also something that I think that um, is exciting for people. I actually didn't have anything for this. I just was looking at Biggie pictures and I thought it was good and relevant, so <laughs> your ideas are never too big. This is another thing that I've always thought to be really true. Um, like the path you're sold is like this really predictable series of events in life. For tech founders that are reading tech blogs outside of the community who don't have insight into the actual culture that these people are living in, it looks like raise money from smart investors, get a good board, raise more money, uh, exit. Like millions of dollars, I don't know, buy a yacht. Like I don't know what people do with that money. But that's like the story we're told and it looks nothing like that. And I think this is something that a lot of founders in the room can attest to. And when you throw like bombs and babies and like natural disasters and car wrecks and like angry wives and angry husbands and like all these things that you could never actually predict into the middle, like it's really ugly. And that's reality. And I think that the more we talk about it and the more we own it, the more we're going to be open for it. This is something that I struggled with a lot actually is that um, I knew it was true but I didn't think about it. I thought a lot of, a lot of things like a technical workflow and I stopped thinking about software for real people and telling the story of what those real people are and being open to other people suggesting it. But more than anything, thinking about why people would use it, whether or not they're buying coffee, whether or not they're paying for school for their kid and making sure they are taken care of every day and also paying like their dog sitter that way or they are building Dwalla into applications to make more money with and also maybe even just getting paid that way for their weekend work taking pictures of weddings. And thinking more about those specific use cases and who we were helping started to allow me to see the product in a totally different way other than just the merchant who we are saving a lot of money for, even though the merchant is still incredibly important. And so, so this is one of the first churches that ever started taking Dwalla. They were paying 9% credit card fees for every single person that tithe to, uh, to their church. And obviously they don't have to do that anymore. You know, I think that creation is greater than consumption. I think every day if you challenge yourself to create over consume, the difference between just like reading tweets and like writing something down that you think or like actually producing some sort of content over just like endlessly consuming it, 
you will attract people who want to interact with you when you do that. You'll create a lot more value for yourself and a lot more uh, for people around you. Like the person who uh, can create no vol value but can only consume it is not really that valuable. Um, some of the harder lessons learned I've learned lately, that's my dog Theo by the way, um, like sleep. I thought that you could like hack sleep, you can't hack it. Um, <laughs> It, it makes you crazy, man. Um, don't try to hack sleep. Make time for it. Actually schedule it if you have a problem with it. Ask people around you to tell you to go home. That was something that I struggled with a lot. Um, investing in great counsel is something that when you do your first investments or you do your first deals, it sounds like, well, dude, I agree. You agree. We're both good people. We like each other. We're going to do business. We're going to get rich together, right? Why else would we be doing this? The reality is, is like, <laughs> Most of those deals go sort of bad at some point in time, and bad just simply means there's a misunderstanding inevitably in all complex business relationships. And getting a good attorney that might actually cost you 20, 40, 50 grand seems insane. Do it, pay it, just get it out of the way. They will protect you in ways that it's hard to appreciate until it's kind of like comes back to haunt you. Um, privacy policies, terms of service, any of that stuff, get great attorneys. Um, this was another thing where, you know, I, I think that. There's like always people or things to hate, but be very selective about who those people and what those things are. It takes a lot of uh, cycles and a lot of energy to actually carry that with you every day. And I think that there have been times when I have thought we just wouldn't work with that person because of this thing that they did. And it stopped us a few times from doing deals that were probably good from us or for us, even though um, we could have even under misunderstood what actually happened. Uh, this is another one, it seems super obvious, but a pointed finger elicits a reaction, not a conversation. The thing is, conversations are really productive. Like, has anyone in the room ever walked in, sight unseen, punched someone in the face, and like, come out of it, everybody's happy, good, like you're drinking a beer in 15 minutes, has anyone had that happen? Like, you're doing the same thing when you walk into a boardroom and you just start like shoving your finger in people's faces. And there are times when like things upset us so much that by the time you interact with someone, you're like, you're so revved up to tell them what you think. Like, there's a part of yourself that you should actually work if you have that, like I do, you just calm it down. It's not productive. Um, your team at work and at home pays for all your bad decisions. Bad decisions such as managing your sleep poorly and like being in a bad mood for like two weeks for every day between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. because you're not sleeping well, basically affects like people really close to you, right? Not sleeping and then not understanding what someone said in an email so you turn down a deal affects people who work for you. It's just a few examples, but the reality is when we start thinking about the ripple effect of the things that we're doing for our team, I think we make better decisions for our team and it allows our companies to grow more quickly. So I realized that are there people that like really value multitasking in the room? I think multitasking is like kind of a fallacy. To really be highly engaged, you have to use your mouth, your eyes, your ears, and your brain for the same things. And when you get too distracted, you're just not e that efficient. It's just like if you have an endless stream of push notifications coming up, you can never actually concentrate on doing one thing well, and you sure as shit are probably not that creative. So another thing for me is I used to see um, probably more potential than I did what people actually had done. And I think that building companies and being a founder, that's how we start. We think that we want to see all the good, but the reality is, is like, not everybody really wants to grow that much. And if you start making decisions about who people could be, you actually sometimes make decisions about who they should be without their permission and they might not ever want to be the person that you decided they should be, and trust me, those all end up going sideways. Um, cut out the cancer. This was uh, some advice I got uh, from Jason Fried at one point. I was having like this really weird problem, and it was somewhat social, somewhat emotional, trying to understand like how to work it out. And he said, like, dude, cut the cancer out. No matter what, it's got to be removed. It's not a question of if it will, do it now. Went and did it, life got better right away. And there's a lot of things where I've thought, is this gonna get worse before it gets better? Is this even not gonna improve? And if that's the case, then just cut the cancer. Scale how you think, not how much work you do. There's a point in time where you just can't do more work, where you can't be awake for more hours, you won't do more meaningful things because you tried to do more. Sometimes that means delegating, sometimes that means not taking on projects, but a lot of the time it just means adopting new methodologies. How many people know fake Grimlock? 
It's awesome. Find fake on uh, Twitter. So like these really simple things of just like find ways of making the world working for you. That's Grimlock. But I think that thinking about how um, you can operate and actually not just taking on more work are things that I think really uh, are amazing. This is, again is one of the things I think I got totally right. Is I didn't just like bail. I didn't leave town. I didn't go to the valley. A lot of the investors that originally tried to invest in the company told us we had to leave in order to take their money. And I said, you're not the right investor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think that that was, I think that was a really good move. I think we're at the position where we have to continue to expand outside the area, but had we not stayed here, we wouldn't have gotten the right early stage investors that got us the structure we needed. Had we not stayed here, we wouldn't have made the friendships with the people in this room who ended up helping us find the investors that we had and the customers we actually originally had. Without actually staying here, I think we would have failed. And so I'm really happy we didn't leave. I think it was the right choice. I also, this is something I put up on Twitter the other day, and I, I believe it to be totally true. And after I talked to um, uh, another founder building a company in the Midwest, he said that they had one position open in 30 applicants or like 40 or something like that. And it's a small company of I think like 10, 12 people. That's not a luxury a lot of companies have. The six-ish jobs we have open, I think we have 300 plus applicants and I'm sure more have come in since I got that information. There's a ton of people here who want to work in interesting companies. So when you read things like there's a talent problem in the paper, call bullshit. There are things that we don't have the talents for here simply because some companies haven't been built here. We have to appreciate that there are people that built certain things inside of Twitter or Pinterest or Facebook that have a specialty that we haven't figured out here yet. We might need to import those people. We might need to f go out and uh, connect to them and open new offices, but like that is what it is. There's still a ton of really amazing people here. I also said no to cubicles. I think that was the right choice. Um, we work in an art gallery, um, not too dissimilar from this stuff, and I think that it was good. Sorry, I don't like. I want to. I want you guys to clap. I like that, but I know I got like 12 more slides, and I'm just watching that thing count down. Um, I know nothing happens overnight, and I never got complacent about how long this company was going to take to build. I think we still probably have another five or ten years for this company to become what it could be and really reach some of its early stage potential. I think it could take 30 years for Dwala to fully realize what it could be. I also think that naively starting the company and incorporating it on LegalZoom, even though how many people like have incorporated their company on LegalZoom? <laughs> That's okay. I did too. Uh, lawyers later redid it and unwound it. Um, but I didn't wait. I used the tools that I had to build what I knew how to build, and I did it myself, and I think that that was a good choice. Um, I didn't know anything about anything I was doing, but again, I had the internet. It's how I learned everything, and then I found the right people to ask through the internet, and most of them let me in the room for whatever reason. And again, it's just sort of worked out because I've kept going. Um, and now I believe that we've created a lot of the things that we set out to create, and that opportunity is unbelievably massive. We're the only company sitting on a technology that actually can provide real-time transfers cross-currency, cross-border, on the simple basis of the internet. It's incredibly powerful and we don't even know how big the market is. Again, in the United States alone, we're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars. What happens, we have no idea, but we know that the market is big enough that um, it's definitely worth pursuing. And the reality is, is the more successful we become, the more money people make. In the United States, that $48 billion is completely uninteresting because it essentially accounts for 3% of the money passing over card networks. When you're talking about somebody in Africa who only makes a few dollars a day, and they could lose as much as 30% of their daily income on a single transaction because of the way they were paid. Would it matter to you if the way you got paid cut 30% out of your income? Like, would that piss you off? Imagine if you didn't have any other option. They don't. But our technology, after we do it here, we'll go do it there, and we're going to give that money back to their economy and to them. Our first 1,000 account holders cost around 70 grand to bring in and get up and running. That seemed astronomical and insane at the time, and I think it was the right choice. That outlay that was completely irrational that everyone told me was stupid um, worked out well. You have things built into you here because you are in the Midwest. There's a certain level of humility that everyone in this room has that I will say uh, is different. That thing where like, you open the door for people when you say, like, please and thank you. And when you decide like, not to call somebody a name um, and just like shake it off and just sort of like, nah, I'm going to go work on my own thing. Those are traits that actually are unique to this area. Don't lose them. Because when you leave, everybody like 
ends up being from the Midwest, amazingly enough. And like, there are these moments where like, dude, only some idiot from Iowa would do that. Like, I think I kind of like you. And it keeps you in rooms and it gets you in a lot more. I think that most of the time, it's better to disagree respectfully rather than disruptively. Think about the punching in the face scenario. You only punch people in the face or get in really relevant arguments when it's really worthwhile. And by the way, that's a man fighting a bear. They're not making sweet love. It's not confusing James. So again, these are like things that I think are baked into us here. Like just telling people around you, please and thank you. And most importantly, like certain people I love you, especially as you're building companies that like, you're just not around a lot of the time and that's part of building it. I think it's really important to overuse those things. Um, I think being religious about being an agent of change is something that you have to stick to. And the reason I say it this way is because if you actually don't believe in the thing that you're doing that is supposed to be really big and you haven't committed to it, it doesn't matter if everyone agrees with you because you're trying to change more minds that are ever gonna wanna join your team. You need to accept that and you need to commit to actually being that person for your company and for your team because the more your team grows, it's not just people relying on you on a paycheck, it's their kids relying on you to get food. That's worth respecting. Um, again, can't please everyone. I'm really low on time, so I'm about done. Um, sticking to like constantly understanding it is your responsibility to change things. At any given moment, right now, if you don't like your job, quit. If you want to start a company, start it. Just stop waiting. There is absolutely no reason to assume anyone will do anything for you. Because if that's the way you live your life, all you will end up with is a whole bunch of um, uh, depressing facts about what no one else ever did for you. And I think that sucks. Um, avoid shiny shit. The more successful you are, you just gotta carry it around. You just gotta move it. Um, avoid it. The more frugal you are about the way you live, I think the more happy you're gonna be. Um, I don't know that to be totally true, but the, every time I purge or I downsize my life, or I think about like, do I really need another pair of shoes? I always end up putting on like dirty chucks. You just don't need all that stuff. Trust your gut. Um, <laughs> It's very important and it sounds cliche, but you are typically probably right about people when you meet them. And you're typically, um, in my experience, going to regret the people, um, or regret relationships with people that you knew were a bad idea. I think it's worth just always repeating, and again, maybe overusing is um, too much, but uh, I'm gonna skip through to the, uh, pretty much the last one. This is a Rollins quote, was the picture of the guy, and this is something that I really uh, use sometimes like a guiding force for me when I'm having like a really crappy day. And the average is the borderline that keeps mere men in their place. Those who step over the line are heroes by the very act, go. I think that a lot of the time people aren't empowered to like do things because they have this view of what they believe normality is. Like I need this, I need this car, I need this house, I need this job, I need this salary, I need this 401k, my wife should have this color hair, like I need this, I need these floors, like there's so much need in the world that it creates like what average people should be. Like I know there is like what is normal and my personal opinion is fuck normal. <laughs> like it's just not, it's just not important I think if you're gonna build something meaningful, you can't be worried about what is normal. Your life is gonna be totally abnormal, and I don't think that's a bad thing. With that, that's the end. I appreciate it very much, guys. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you.